Now for the chemistry of hormones. So hormones can either be steroids or non-steroid hormones. Steroid or steroid-like hormones, um, you have your steroid hormones. Those are made out of cholesterol. They start off as a cholesterol molecule and then different enzymes will change that cholesterol into different hormones. So for example, all of the sex hormones, testosterone and the, andro the androgens and the estrogens, all of those started off as a cholesterol molecule. The same um, goes for the hormones of the adrenal cortex or cortisol and aldosterone. Those also started off as a cholesterol molecule. Um, Steroid-like hormone would be thyroxine, for example. Uh, we will see that the steroid and steroid-like hormones, those have um, the same mechanism of action on their target cells. While the non-steroid hormones, which used to actually be called protein hormones, but now they are called a not just non-steroid hormones, those are either made out of an amino acid where the cell would take an amino acid like tyrosine, for example, and switch it up a little bit in order to make epinephrine or norepinephrine. That is known as an amine hormone. A peptide hormone, that is a short chain of, of amino acids, for example, oxytocin. A protein hormone that's made out of a longer chain of amino acids, for, for instance, growth hormone. While glycoprotein is a protein where you add a little part of, you add a carbohydrate to it. So you have a carbohydrate joined to protein. For example, TSH, and TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So two things to keep in mind when you are talking about steroid versus non-steroid hormones. Steroid hormones is made out of cholesterol, so which means that it's a lipid, it's fat, it cannot dissolve in the bloodstream. Okay, so how is it that that steroid hormone made, say, in the adrenal cortex, how can it circulate through the bloodstream to reach its target cells if it is not soluble in water? So we'll take a look at that in another at another um, slide. While your non-steroid hormones, well, those are proteins, and proteins are water-soluble, so they have no problem circulating in the bloodstream. Now let's take a look at the actions of hormone. What happens to the target cells when they are stimulated by hormones? So the hormones change the metabolic process of their target cells, either by changing the activity of the enzymes, so they can either stimulate or inhibit enzyme activity, or they can change the rate of membrane transport of a substance, meaning that they could open up maybe sodium channel gates, or they would open up maybe they would increase the uptake of glucose through a transporter into the cell, like what insulin does. So they either change the rate of membrane transport across the cell membrane of the target cell, or they change the enzyme activity inside of the cell. And make sure that you keep in mind that when we say change, does not necessarily mean have to increase. A change could either be an increase or a decrease in these uh, factors. So again, hormones are going to deliver the message by binding to their receptors on the target cell. And um, hormones can actually produce their effects in extremely low concentrations. So we do not have high levels of hormones. We have actually very low levels of hormones, but they are able to produce um, major effects on their target cells. And our target cells have the ability to change the number of receptors that are found um, on them. Um, and that is a process known as up regulation or down regulation. So each individual target cell has the ability to either increase the number of receptors or decrease the number of receptors on themselves. Um, so in the process of down regulation, for example, so let's say a person has maybe hyperthyroidism, meaning that their thyroid gland makes too much thyroxine. So there's a lot of thyroxine circulating within their bloodstream and their cells, the target cells of, um, are being overstimulated. 
So what the cells can do, they can hide their receptors, okay? So they kind of engulf them inside and hide them or destroy them. So that thyroxin, so now they are no longer overstimulated by these, by that extra thyroxin. So that again is down regulation or decreasing the number of receptors found on the target cell. And that usually happens, as I mentioned, in increased hormonal levels. But let's take the opposite scenario where a person has hypothyroidism. So their thyroid gland is not making enough thyroxin. What the target cells would do would upregulate or increase the number of receptors in order to pick up any thyroxin molecule that is out there. Okay, so again, these target cells have the ability to either upregulate or downregulate. Now, we'll talk about the steroid and steroid-like hormones. And again, we usually talk about this in the context of thyroid hormones. So steroid and thyroid hormones, like I said, have poor water solubility. Okay, so they are lipid-soluble, but not water-soluble. So how is it that they can be carried in the bloodstream when we know that blood is mainly made out of water? they would have to be coated or covered by a protein. Okay, so the steroid and thyroid hormones are carried by plasma proteins in the bloodstream. Um, they are shuttled, okay, through the bloodstream by these plasma proteins until they reach their target cells. And, but because they are fat soluble, Okay, they can cross through the lipid bilayer of the cell membranes. They're able to enter their target cells very easily. And that's why their receptors are found inside of the target cells. The receptors are either in the cytoplasm, we call those cytoplasmic receptors, or even inside of the nucleus, and that is known as a nuclear receptor. So I'm going to take a look at this image right here. And what you are looking at, this right here, huge, this is your huge target cell. That is the bilayer of phospholipid making the cell membrane. This is the nucleus with the nuclear pore. There is your DNA. Um, and that is a ribosome. Okay, so what is going on here? Here we have a hormone molecule. This is a steroid or a thyroid hormone. Again, it's coated by a plasma protein in order to be circulated and transported in the bloodstream. Once it reaches its target cell, it will enter, and it has the ability to diffuse through the cell membrane because it is lipid soluble, and it will enter the nucleus through these nuclear pores and you can see here the receptor found inside of the nucleus. So this is an intracellular receptor. Um, to be specific, it's actually an intranuclear receptor. And you can see here that the hormone and the, horm the receptor combine together. That is going to lead to the um, process of protein synthesis. So you see here the DNA is unwinding. We've made a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA exits the nucleus, and we start the process here of translating this messenger RNA into a protein chain. So steroid and thyroid hormones produce their effect through simulating protein synthesis. Okay, now we will take a look at the non-steroid hormones. Non-steroid hormones are mainly made out of amino acids or proteins, so they are water soluble. They do not need that protein carrier. They are actually protein. Uh, their target cells or the receptors are found on the surface of the target cell. So we'll take a look at this image right here. Here again is the target cell. That is the non-steroid hormone. And you can see here that this is the receptor and the hormone attaches to that um, surface receptor. It's called a surface receptor because it's found on the surface membrane or on the um, cell membrane. Now this hormone is not going to enter the cell, but it needs to produce changes inside of the cell. And that, um, so how is it that it'll take the message 
from the inside, sorry, from the outside to the inside of the cell. Well, that occurs in two different steps. Well, first off, it attached to the surface receptor. Now, the second step is that it'll lead to changes inside of the cell by the activation of an, an enzyme known as adenylate cyclase enzyme. Adenylate cyclase enzyme is going to break down ATP and change it into CAMP. CAMP stands for cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or we'll just call it CAMP for short. Now, CAMP is going to activate different proteins depending on where you are in the cell, and that's why, you know, we're just kind of vaguely calling it activation of different proteins, which is basically activating of different enzymes depending on which hormone it is, depending on which cell in the body this is. So this non-steroid hormone is considered a first messenger, while your second messenger is the CAMP. Because again, that non-steroid hormone molecule is unable to get into the cell, so it has to relay the message through a second messenger, which in this case is CAMP. So your non-steroid hormones um, relay their message through a process known as signal transduction. And signal transduction means transducing or carrying the, the, uh, the message from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And that needs a second messenger, which in a lot of the cases, your second messenger would be CAMP. And CAMP, again, is made by the activation of adenylate cyclase enzyme that breaks down ATP into CAMP. Little clinical application here on the abuse of hormones to improve athletic performance. And we're talking about steroids, growth hormone, and erythropoietin. Um, steroid, which is unfortunately not as uncommon as we think to abuse steroids to increase muscular strength, but it has a lot of harmful effects. So if you take steroids um, from an external source, well, you are really preventing, you're kind of making your adrenal cortex lazy so that it doesn't need to produce any internal steroids. Okay, this will decrease your natural, also decrease the natural testosterone production. It can lead to growth, uh, retardation, or stunting of the growth. Breast development in males, a male sexual characteristic in females. It could damage the kidney, liver, and heart. It could also lead to the increase of LDL cholesterol, which are really your bad cholesterol. And it could also lead to psychological problems. So these are all disadvantages or side effects of the abuse of steroids. Now, growth hormone is also abused for to increase athletic performance in order to enlarge the muscles, increasing their strength and endurance. But sometimes they are used with steroids or just on their own, but they again have a long list of side effects as well. Erythropoietin doesn't really have an action or a direct action on the muscles, but what it does is that it increases the number of red blood cells, which means that the oxygen capacity or the capacity to deliver oxygen to muscles is increased. And um, although we do use this to treat certain kinds of anemia, but it has been abused by athletics in order to increase their own production of our red blood cells. But the thing is, if they induce it too much, that could lead to increase in the thickness or the viscosity of blood, and that can lead to blood clots, heart attacks, and death. Now this control of hormonal secretions, we will start talking in another section.